Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. My name is Salam al Mariyadi, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I'm so honored uh, to have a conversation with really a dear friend. Uh, I think we've known each other over 20 years. Yeah. Who f first, I, I have to take credit. Uh, I think one of his first appearances what, uh, was at a Muslim Public Affairs Council convention. I think so. That was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. This young scholar, this rising star. Coming and I out. think I had hair like to Yeah, hair you had hair. Something. That yeah. was a lot longer. That's right. <laughs> and uh, black. Yeah. Not, you know. yeah. Well, we all, we all go through uh, <laughs> our, our bruises and, and aging, and, and uh, it's a sign of maturity, of yeah. course. Um, but Reza, good to have you. Reza Aslan, uh, an accomplished author, scholar, has written on religion and politics, which is the subject of the book, this children's book uh, that he's just come out with on uh, a kid's book about Israel and Palestine. But we, before we get to it, um, just a little bit more about yourself. Uh, your family's from Iran. You came to the United States, and then you decided to take on uh, politics and religion, <laughs> something that very few people talk about at the dinner table. Yeah, unless so you're what, not supposed to. Yeah, what led you to that? I think it was my childhood experience of revolutionary Iran. We left uh, in 79 when I was seven years old. So it was old enough to understand exactly what was going on um, and, uh, and why we needed to leave. And then also coming to the United States, arriving just around the time that the hostage crisis starts. So we're talking about 444 days in which Americans are being held hostage in Tehran um, at the U.S. Embassy. And I was, you know, seven, eight years old, sitting in classrooms. You know, my teachers were wearing those little yellow ribbons in solidarity with the hostages that my fellow students would almost on a daily basis uh, get information about what was going on in the hostage crisis. And everybody knew that I was the Iranian in the room. And so uh, feeling the kind of the weight of identity and culture and religion, even at a time in which perhaps I couldn't have verbalized it or, or put it into words, um, I think really affected me uh, and gave me this lifelong interest, not just in religion and politics, but a lifelong interest in the different ways in which we as human beings identify ourselves, how we form our identities. And fundamentally, that's what religion and politics are. Religion is a form of identity. Politics is a form of identity. And so it was kind of a natural uh, road for me to take to just start really delving into these big questions of how do we define who we are as individuals and as a community. And what I knew for sure is that I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I never at any point wanted to be anything else. I have no memory of ever wanting to be an astronaut or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, from the very beginning, the only occupation I ever considered for myself was uh, a writer. But I'm, you know, the child of immigrant parents. And uh, so when I told my mom that I wanted to be a writer, uh, she said, who's stopping you from writing? You go be a doctor <laughs> or a lawyer, and then you can write. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I, right. I, wanna, I wanna do writing as a living. Yeah. And she said, that's not a thing. Um, and so I thought, all right, well, I'll become a professor, because I'll still be around you know, academia, and I enjoy reading, and I enjoy learning, and so that'll, that'll be the job that I have. And my mom can still call me doctor, even though I'm not a real doctor. You know, <laughs> you can still say, this is my son, doctor. Um, and, uh, and then, it, you know, the, the sort of the greatest joy of my life is that I was able to bring those two loves, the love of religion and politics and identity, and my desire to be a writer together. And, um, and I've been doing this now for 20-something years. Your family's from Iran, and Iran is really misunderstood in the West. Uh, but it's also underestimated in terms of its role in Islamic philosophy. Uh, a lot of the uh, historical analyses from great scholars mm -hmm. come from that region. Uh, those who would work on putting together books of jurisprudence or uh, poets like uh, Rumi and, 
and so many other uh, great intellectual figures. Yeah. Um, where does that come from? Why, why, is, why is Iran a place where you find a lot of that um, intellectual yeah. um, uh, force that you don't find, quite frankly, in much of the Middle East? There's two fundamental reasons for it. Um, one of them has to do the, with that issue of identity again, that when we're talking about Iran, we're talking about these two prevailing um, national and cultural identities that have often been in conflict with each other. There's Islamic Iran, and then there's ancient Persia. Um, the Persian identity, which goes back thousands of years, and which is one of the greatest civilizations that the world has ever known, still very much feeds the ethos of what it means to be Iranian. But certainly since, you know, the 7th century AD when Iran became Islamic, um, those two identities have been in tension with one another. When they are in conflict, which is the case over the last century in Iran, in which you have first a succession of shahs that try to strip away the Islamic identity and focus solely on the kind of ancient Persian identity, and then the flip side of that, when you have the Islamic Republic, which tries to deny the ancient Persian identity and focus solely on the Islamic identity, that is when the Iranian culture is destabilized. That's when it doesn't function properly. Um, you have a massive backlash uh, taking place right now against all things religion in Iran. I mean, it's especially among the young people, they have no interest in religion and certainly not in Islam at all, but they are fascinated by ancient Iran. And then the flip side of that was during the, the first half of the 20th century, you had young people who didn't care about ancient Persia and were wholly fascinated by Iran's Islamic identity. So in other words, reacting to whatever the government was pushing against them. The times in which those two identities can marry and become sort of comfortable with each other are the great flowering moments of Iranian culture and history. The great Iranian poets, Hafez and Chayyam, these guys were able to take sort of the beauty of both of those aspects of the identity, Persia and Iran, and marry them together to create something new. And I think those are the moments that I that I pray that we can get to again one day in Iran because it is, the, the culture there is so immense and beautiful and, uh, and globally resonant that it has been stifled for so long because of the political leadership. And then the second reason is that from the moment of the Islamic conquest of, the, of Iran and the Persian Empire, Iran became a kind of clearinghouse for alternative forms of Islam, for alternative forms of religiosity. So when you had, for instance, the sort of the massive Sunni empire um, that kind of uh, flew uh, f out of the, the first group of Muslims mm -hmm. to kind of come out of the Arabian Peninsula, Iran became the place where you could be Muslim, but not the imperial branch of Islam, where you can blend some Zoroastrianism and a little bit of Hinduism and a little bit of Buddhism, and you can borrow a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of Judaism and then put it all into this new kind of Islam. We now refer to it as Shia Islam, but back then it was this kind of hodgepodge of different belief systems that became a a place, like a, a safe haven, if you will, for those who wanted to become Muslim, wanted to experience uh, an Islamic identity and spirituality, but wanted that identity be, to be divorced from the imperial Islam uh, that was being you know, forced upon them by the, the, the dominant culture at the time. And from that moment, the seventh century, that identity has always been there. You know, the Iranian Islam has, for the most part, been very syncretistic, very 
uh, easily borrowing other ideas and other you know thoughts and kind of marrying it into itself. And I think it's those two reasons: the dual identity of Islam uh, of Iran, and the fact that it's always been a kind of oppositional place, um, has created what I think is a truly unique uh, religious environment that, again, unfortunately, has been violently stifled for the last four decades, but which I truly believe can be the, the soil out of which a new Iran can arise. And in that region, most governments don't represent the sentiment of the people. Uh, and I would say that... Ditto here. Yeah. And, <laughs> We're, we're not yeah. there yet, but yes, we're getting closer, which is <laughs> something that we're trying to push back against. But regardless, uh, in, in, the, in, in the Middle East, most countries are run by uh, right. blatant dictatorships, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, Iran con considers itself to be uh, a democracy. And in some ways, it's more democratic than... Saudi Arabia or well, that, Egypt. That's certainly yeah. true. Yeah, the bar is yeah. very low. Yeah, the bar is low. <laughs> the bar is low. However, um, th there still is a, a, a lot of popular resentment yeah. uh, against the government to the point that, I don't, from my standpoint, it seems that some of the most anti-religious elements are coming now from Iran because religion and state have been fused. That's right. And uh, historically, whenever that happens, yeah, like in Europe, people are become anti-religion, uh, and, and that's what's happening in the Middle East today. Um, where do you see the popular movement now? And is it moving away from religion be because of, of the government, or is there, is there still an Islamic element among the people that is separate from the, from the state? In Iran, uh, the population, particularly the young population, is violently anti-religion. But that doesn't mean that religion and Islam doesn't play still a profound role in their culture and in their identity. You know, all around the world, religion is culture. Culture is religion. They're kind of married to each other and very difficult to sort of separate those two things out. But insofar as religion as a set of norms and principles, as a set of do's and don'ts, um, for most Iranians, the majority of young Iranians especially, they have zero interest in it because they were born in a country in which religion is a tool of oppression, right? They don't they weren't born sort of before the Islamic Revolution. This is the only world that they know. The only Islam that they are familiar with is the top-down Islam that is pressed upon them by the mullahs. And because they have no love whatsoever for the government, they, they attach Islam and the government. They consider it sort of one entity. And so when they're anti-government, they're anti-Islam. Then they go home. They go, you know, to their, to their private sanctuaries. And there, in sort of the privacy of their lives, um, Islam is still very much a cultural part of how they see the world. Um, they just don't... It's the sort of institutionalization of it in Iran that they are sort of violently reacting against. And I think, you know, most people who study Iranian culture will tell you that it's been, a, you know, more than four decades at this point, but that if this government continues the way it is, then you're talking about a generation or two in Iran that will absolutely, rabidly reject religion, which doesn't come as a surprise to us, doesn't come as a surprise to anybody who's studied, you know, religion and power. But I think, you know, is sort of the opposite of what the entire philosophy or theological principle behind the Islamic Republic was supposed to be, right? Which was uh, state-based morality. Well, when the state sets itself up as the foundation for morality, religious morality no, no, no less, and then 
repeatedly, ostentatiously violates that morality, mm -hmm. well, then it's all BS then, isn't it? Right. Then it's all nonsense. Then I don't have to take any of it seriously. Yeah. And to your other point, we're kind of going through the same thing with what we call democracy in the U.S. Yeah. Constitution <clears throat> and the yeah. First Amendment. Um, so it takes us to the issue of Palestine here. Uh, for many Iranians, as, as well as I'm sure many people throughout the region, there is that sympathy or affinity uh, towards Palestine. Uh, yet Iran, under the Shah especially, was an in, in ally uh, of Israel. Now it's considered an arch enemy uh, mm -hmm. of Israel. But I'm talking now about popular sentiment. Where is that popular sentiment in the region, not just Iranians, but throughout the Middle East, throughout um, the Gulf, throughout even South Asia, in terms, uh, in, as it relates to Palestine? Well, frankly, I, I'm glad that you put it in that, those terms, because it is different in Iran than it is in the rest of the Middle East, or frankly, the rest of the Muslim world. In the Middle East and the larger Muslim-majority countries, Palestine has become the new Ummah, right? The, you know, you, when you're talking about 1.6, 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, this idea that like we, we are all united as a single community is a beautiful thought, but in practice isn't real, right? There's very little that I have in common with a Muslim in Egypt. There's very little that that Muslim in Egypt has in common with a Muslim in Indonesia. There's very little that that Muslim in Indonesia has in common with a Muslim in Senegal. Right. Right? We all call each other Muslims. We all, you know, pray and we all read the Quran. And, but, like, the relationship that we have with our religion is vastly different. Um, so then what is the Ummah anymore? This is, a, you know, uh, a, an issue that I've been writing about and thinking about for a very, very long time. Um, you know, does the Ummah only exist in the virtual world? Is it just an idea that doesn't, it's not real anymore? I would say that like right now, <laughs> Palestine is the closest thing that we have to this kind of sun around which we all orbit, mm. right? Because the oppression of the Palestinians is so obvious, it's such a demonstrable fact. Um, the injustice is so difficult to ignore that it's the one thing that regardless of where you're from, regardless of what language you speak, regardless of your, your relationship with your religion, it's the one thing that we hold in common with each other. And I think that's why the attention of so much of the world is focused on this tiny parcel of land. Again, I have to set Iran apart somewhat. Mm. And the reason for that is, as one would expect, because the Iranian government has used the plight of the Palestinians to justify its own rule, right? right. Um, it has, again, turned the Iranian people away from the Palestinian cause, right? It's not that Iranians aren't sympathetic for the suffering the Palestinians are experiencing. Of course they are. It's not like that. That's, you know, that's where their sympathy lies. Of course, that's where their sympathy lies. But because the government in Iran has co-opted the Palestinian cause to make it part of their raison d'etre, right? Part of their, mm -hmm. their argument for why they should be in charge of the bureaucratic and moral elements of the country, it makes it much harder to divorce the cause of the Palestinians from the way it's used as propaganda from your own government. Um, and again, that I think is a, is a real shame because, you know, I think Iranians, because of their proximity to Israel, because of their relationship to Israel, because of the fact that Iran to this day boasts the largest Jewish community in the entire Middle East outside of Israel, um, has a lot of common cause with the, the Palestinian situation, but again, everything is colored through their absolute and completely understandable loathing for their own government. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about the Jewish community in Iran. My, my father's, my parents are from uh, Baghdad, Iraq, and 
when they were growing up, he said, my father would say, you know, the Jewish families and the Christian families and, and, and the rest of us, we never really made it an issue, you know, in terms of religious uh, identity. That came later. That came after 1948. Right, yes. Right. And you said that Iran has one of the largest Jewish populations in the region. There's still a significant amount uh, of, of Jews in Iran. They are Iranian. They're right? Iranian. And They've been there for generations. For generations. generations. Yeah. Um, some, I, I take it, left to go to Israel uh, at some point, just like uh, yes. Iraqi Jews. And, and to the U.S. And mm -hmm. to the U.S. But um, what, what's the status of Jews in Iran today? Well, the legal status is that they are protected peoples, right? Um, Iranians, um, Jews, uh, Buddhists, and uh, which are, there are a lot of Iranian Buddhists, people forget, and Zoroastrians are technically, legally speaking, protected, right? So they have a certain number of seats that are reserved for them in the Iranian parliament. Um, they have equal access, and I put the terms equal access, uh, as non-Muslims, uh, or as Muslims do when it comes to penal codes and things like that. But of course, culturally, religiously, because we are talking about a, a religious fascism, which is what, what Iran, I think, is the best way to think about it. People, people talk about it as a theocracy. Theocracy is not the right term mm. for Iran. Mm -hmm. um, Theocracy, it's, I don't, it's complicated, but that's the rule of God. And this isn't the rule of God. This is... Um, it's really ideological imposition. It is, it right? is, it yeah. is right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very complex issue about Shiism and, it's, and the way that it understands um, uh, messianic concepts, etc., etc., and the Balayat of Faqih. It's all very, very complicated. Fascinating, but complicated. Right. But fundamentally, the right way to think about Iran is that it is a fascist ideology, fascist meaning worship of the nation, but it's a religious fascism. So the nation has become the stand-in for God, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a form of idol worship. It is a form of <laughs> idol worship. <laughs> right. so that's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, as a, as a result of that, yes, that there's this sort of constant conflict um, in the way that Islam is expressed, um, even by the most devout of Iranians. I think sometimes from the outside we think, oh, Iran is divided between secularists and the religious people. And that's not exactly correct. Yes, there is a divide between those two groups. But as we saw in the women's movement, you know, a couple of years ago, some of the, the most potent uh, voices of opposition were coming from uh, the religious groups, right? The, the women who were out there demanding change and equal rights weren't just young women without hijabs. There were older women wearing chadors, you know, who were with them. So it's, you know, like most things, it's, it's much more complicated than we think it is. So in your book, a kid's book about Israel and Palestine now, 1948 happens. Uh, you mentioned a few historical landmarks, the Holocaust, of course, uh, World War I, when Britain and mm -hmm. France took over uh, as colonial powers mm -hmm. in, in the Middle East, then the Nakba mm -hmm. in 1948. Um, what, what made you choose those landmarks as the uh, basis for this book for children? What I wanted to do was write a book that presented both national narratives, the Israeli national narrative and the Palestinian national narratives, sort of side by side without uh, devaluing one or the other. This is, sounds easy, but it's a lot harder <laughs> than, than it actually sounds because the truth of the matter is that regardless of where you fall in this conflict, Oftentimes, the simple act of um, associating with or accepting one of these national narratives necessarily requires denying the other one, right? Mm -hmm. 
Like if if I can say that, oh, the the Jews fleeing uh, European oppression um, had you know a right to safety, a security, and a Jewish majority state of their own, then necessarily I am denying the Palestinian cause. But if I say that Palestinians who were there before these European Jews arrived and who had been there for centuries and who were fighting for their own independence, uh, which they were promised uh, by uh, the Allies at the end of the Second World War, and then suddenly told, no, 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 you only get half of what you were asking for. Um, if you accept that point of view, then you're immediately denying the Israeli national narrative. And what I wanted to see was, can you present both of these narratives without overly blaming one or the other, without placing all of the responsibility on one or the other, or without denying one or the other? And can you give it to young people who, unlike most of us, <laughs> older people, have the capacity to maintain multiple perspectives, sometimes conflicting perspectives, sometimes contradictory perspectives in their minds. They're, they're, this, the research on the way that children learn and the way that they retain information all says the same thing, that children have the ability to maintain these complex, sometimes conflicting ideas in their minds in a way that adults do not. Um, that when presented in an age-appropriate way, they can easily bounce from shoe to shoe, from place to place, understand both views, both ideas. And so it was kind of using that research, that, that data to say, look, can you see both sides of this, of this conflict? You know, can you see both of them? Because if you can, then as I say in the book, that's a kind of superpower that you have as a child. Um, it means that you have the ability to cultivate empathy and compassion, that you can um, develop the critical thinking skills necessary, if for no other reason than to reject the stereotypes, the prejudices, the overt racism that is so often married to any conversation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I, I, you know, it's been a, a wonderful journey these couple of months since the book has been out to sort of see that actually happen. Uh, not just in my own children, I have four kids, but in the, the stories that I hear, the emails that I get from parents telling me the way in which they've used this book to create precisely the safe space necessary to foster trust right. between <clears throat> parents, caregivers, and their children. And if you can talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in these safe spaces, then you can talk about anything. Mm -hmm. then you can talk about climate change. You can talk about racism. Right. You can talk about sexuality and gender, right? All of these things become um, a, a sort of foundation through which you can build trust and kinship, you know, with your children. Yeah. And, f and if we want coexisting uh, states, if you will, or peoples in the Middle East, we have to have coexisting narratives here in America uh, and not uh, one narrative to the exclusion uh, of that's the right. other. Um, I think that's, that's an important part in terms of peacemaking. So I, I, I really uh, value that point that you just made. Um, now, as we talked about Iranian Jews, there were Palestinian Jews even before 1948. Um, and um, you didn't, obviously, you wouldn't have space to get into it here, but from your scholarly uh, 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 history of, of work, uh, collection of work and, 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 and readings, what was the status of Jews uh, during this Islamic period, yeah, uh, especially period, yeah. in, in, in Jerusalem and the Holy Land? The Jews in Ottoman-occupied Palestine were one of a dozen different religious groups that had made this land their home for centuries. There were multiple sects of Christianity, multiple sects of uh, Islam, 
uh, Baha'is, um, there are some Zoroastrians that were there. Druze. Um, Druze, of yeah. course, yeah. yeah. So many different religious communities. Yeah. And I think what people fail to understand when they think or talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that this is a very new conflict. I mean, the thing that probably drives me the most insane when it comes to conversations around this issue is this line that you hear constantly from religious leaders, from yeah. political leaders, from people on both sides, which is, well, this is a centuries old conflict. Yeah. What are we gonna do about it? This has right. been going on for hundreds of years. No, it has not. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. not been going on for hundreds of years. It's been going on for 70 years. That's mm -hmm. what's going on. And, and it is because of a particular historical moment, not necessarily 1948, the birth of Israel, though of course that is a symptom of it, but that historical moment was the World War II era in which the European Allied powers made it abundantly clear, not just to the people of Palestine, but to the people of the entire region, that if you follow us, if you fight along with us, against the access powers, when this war is over, we will give you your independence. And everywhere that they said that, it was a lie. But in Palestine, that lie was buttressed by the fact that at the same time that this promise was being made, the floodgates were being opened to mass migration of European Jews, many of whom, of course, were fleeing genocide and the Holocaust. Um, and so they created this situation that was untenable, and then the second it was untenable, they walked away from it, <laughs> right? The second it was no longer easy to control, they were like, well, this is your problem, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, let you deal with it. That was the moment of conflict, right? To, to go back to, you know, Ottoman-controlled Palestine and to talk about it as though this was a land in which Jews and Christians and Muslims were fighting amongst each other is nonsense. I mean, were there conflicts yeah. here and there? Of course, of course there are. There are conflicts in, in yeah. my neighborhood, right. <laughs> you know? Right. But for the most part, these different groups lived in peace and harmony with each other, and they all thought of themselves as different religions but the same culture. And so, uh, to your point, uh, one of the fabrics of history that is often lost in these conversations is the role of Ottoman Jews who were living in Palestine for generations and who saw, also saw themselves being inundated uh, by European Jews. You know, Jews that they may have shared a religious identity with, but they shared nothing else with, not culture, not language, not ethnicity, um, and who felt just as uncomfortable um, with this wave of migration and the way that the British were dealing with it as the non-Jewish Palestinians. Um, th those, are, those are voices that, as you rightly note, are often silenced in these conversations. One point that I'm always interested in getting um, responses from people, scholars like you, is that during that time when Britain and France divided the Middle East and they kicked out the Hashemites from Arabia and made it into what's now <laughs> Saudi Arabia um, uh, and, and created a, another country called Transjordan and gave the Hashemites that and Iraq, mm -hmm. but they kept Palestine to themselves. They never, they, they kept it under British mandate. Now, one could say, well, yeah, because their plan was to uh, create the Jewish homeland from the Belfort Declaration. Right. But what other strategic reasons was there, were there for Britain to hold on to Palestine at that time? There were no strategic reasons. Mm. We can go back thousands of years and talk about the role that this tiny strip of land has played in the birth and spread of global religions and sort of the culture and the way that in, in our human imagination, 
um, this land has played. And, and historically speaking, it's been incredibly important. But the one thing that cannot be denied is how valueless this land actually is. It gives nothing. It's not a bread basket. The bread basket is just all around it, right? The fertile crescent is just around this land. It's not a major port. It has uh, obviously um, uh, water access, but so does a lot of the Mediterranean region. Um, you go back to the Greeks, you go back to the Romans, you go back to uh, the Arabs, the, the, the Byzantines who controlled it, and in every single one of those situations, historically speaking, what you find is people who are absolutely grasping onto a land that, for all intents and purposes, has no value whatsoever, you know, insofar as what makes an empire want a strip of land, right? Does it give us grain? Does it give us wood? Does it give us a naval capacity? This gives you nothing except it has this and has for a very, very long time this holy patina to it. It's a land that is sacred in and of itself that provides nothing much of use, not even to this day would I say that it provides security. You know, we always talk about how, well, our interests, the United States, our interests in Israel align with our security interests. No, they don't. No, they do not. That is a false statement. We have more bases, you know, in Jordan and in Saudi and in Qatar, you know, than we have in Israel. Those are far more valuable uh, 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 national security interests than Israel does. Um, all of this is to say that for reasons that are difficult to speak of without really getting into the spirituality of it, this land has for thousands of years maintained this sense of sanctity, the sacredness to it. And that has infected the way that we have dealt with it, the way that we have talked about it, the way that we have passed it from empire to empire, the way that we have fought for it. Because, you know, my favorite, uh, there's not a lot of images in the book, but my favorite image is an image of sort of the region, because the point of it is to show you how teeny, tiny, insignificant this strip of land that so much focus and attention uh, is on and has been for thousands of years. And the reason for it is because it means something. It's holy. You brought the Balfour Declaration. I know I'm going on for a little bit, but the Balfour Declaration, which was essentially the commitment of the British government to allow for what would become fundamentally unchecked Jewish immigration into the Palestinian territories with the possibility of perhaps uh, creating a uh, distinct Jewish state. The Balfour Declaration is a religious document. People, people need to go back and read that. Like mm. It is dripping with theological significance. And Balfour himself was a fundamentalist Christian who believed that the, the recreation of the kingdom of David would lead to the end times and the return of Jesus. Christian Zionism. Yeah. So let's, even then, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> we're, we're, we cannot divorce religion and mm -hmm. religious thinking from the way that this land and its people have been treated and handled by successive empires, by successive governments for thousands of years. Um, there are some people who claim that Palestine never existed. There is never such a thing as Palestine. Yet the Belfort Declaration said it's the Belfort Declaration for <laughs> yeah, Palestine. Yeah, yeah. It was a colonial project in Palestine. Yeah, yeah. It was whatever. Uh, what do you say to people who, who, who claim that Palestine never existed? Well, in fact, that was sort of the, um, the first moment of controversy about this book, is that it's called a kid's book about Israel and Palestine, mm. right? Not Israel slash Palestine not Israel and the Palestinian territories. I mean, it's really interesting because I keep doing these um, 
interviews, either on you know, radio or television or whatever the case may be, and the book is called A Kid's Book About Israel and Palestine, but uh, are, they are specifically prohibited from referring to Palestine as Palestine. You know, these, these uh, CNN and, and uh, NPR, they have rules about what they can and cannot call it. So they can't call Palestine Palestine. They have to call it the Palestinian territories or the occupied territories or at best occupied Palestine or something like that. Um, so even that alone, just saying the word Palestine apparently is controversial in some way. This is, you know, it's such an anti-historical argument and it's so ideological that it's hard to, to take it very seriously. Um, I think, you know, what you see on especially the sort of radical right wing in Israel is that if there was no Palestine, right, that this was just Ottoman territory, right, didn't belong to anyone, it was just there and we just right. kind of came and took Ottoman it. Ottoman backwaters. Ottoman basically. backwaters. Yep. Um, then that means there was no such thing as a Palestinian. And if there's no such thing as a Palestinian, then all of this hand-wringing about what do we do? We're military-occupied power. We have an illegal occupation on land that doesn't belong to us. We, um, you know, we, uh, and, and everything that's involved, we're in violation of the uh, Fourth Convention of the Geneva Accords. Um, you know, uh, at best, you know, the, the hand-wringing about how do we maintain a sense of democracy while also maintaining a Jewish majority when the demographics have shifted and there's really no more Jewish majority between the river and the sea any longer, but we control all of it. None of that matters anymore because there's no such thing as a Palestinian. These are just random Arabs who happen to be on this land. I, I mean, I don't really need to make an argument against that notion. It's so anti-historical. It's so ideological. It's so profoundly racist that even talking about it, you know, even responding to it gives it more attention than it deserves. But you get why it's such an appealing argument, particularly for the right wing. Now, in terms of Israel, of, of course, we all, we all condemn the Holocaust. It was the worst war crime in the 20th century. Uh, but it led to punishing uh, the Palestinian people. Uh, in an area that is sacred, as, as, you, as you noted, to so many people, including 1.5 billion Muslims today. Um, you decided to write this book to provide these two coexisting and competing narratives. What is your objective then, you know, in terms of how this, w this can shape the minds of young people who are going to be our leaders today? Because you and I talked earlier uh, on how our current political leaders in the United States, they're in a time warp. They are in a time warp. As if we're, yeah. we're still in the 70s or the 80s. We're long past that. There's a new generation now who, feel, who are uh, very adamantly pro-Palestinian. Um, there are, are these disruptions on campuses. The school officials don't know how to handle it. The Department of Education doesn't know how to handle it. The Congress is, is making it worse. How can this book contribute to shaping a more constructive uh, narrative on the issue? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's so important. I think any objective observer of what's going on in the United States, the, the, the politics uh, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, can tell that there has been a massive pendulum swing in the way in which Americans understand, as I was saying before, these two national narratives. And I can give you data and research and surveys to prove that out. But just from an anecdotal point of view, I have been visiting, writing about, talking about, uh, and advising about Israel-Palestine uh, since 2003. And that's 20 years. And in those 20 years, I can tell you that like, what I've been saying hasn't changed, well, except for you know, maybe a couple of things here and there, which my brain has actually, again, as an older man, become ossified. Um, but 
the response to it has been so radically different. I remember after my, I think, third trip to Israel, um, this was right after the, I guess it was right after the second uh, Netanyahu uh, premiership uh, began. Um, and I came home very depressed, uh, you know, thinking there's really no, no hope here anymore for a two-state solution, that that ship is gone. Um, and I wrote an article in the New York Times, uh, a op-ed in the New York Times, um, for arguing for the one-state solution, which had been around for a very, very long time. People mm -hmm. have been talking, mostly Palestinians have been talking about it for a very, very long time. And the backlash that I received from that article was overwhelming. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, I guess maybe a decade ago, 12, 12 13 years ago. Today, when I talk about the one state solution, whether I'm talking to Jews or Muslims or government officials or anyone, they all just kind of like, they sort of nod along. Even yeah. if they can't overtly say anything, they're just like, mm-hmm. The Palestinian narrative, which had been subsumed by the Israeli one because of our political leaders, because of our media for decades, now because of the, the way in which information has changed, the way that our access to information has changed, the gatekeepers to the media are vastly different now, has suddenly broken through the zeitgeist. And especially for younger people, when they look at both of these narratives in a clear-eyed way, there isn't a lot of confusion about who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed, right? Who is the power and who is the powerless? There's this constant conversation in, uh, in sort of traditional media outlets that paints Israel as David and the Palestinians as Goliath. No one who takes a look at the situation in any sort of objective way could possibly believe that to be the case. And so when you see these protests taking place across campuses, what you are seeing is the manifestation of the way in which Americans, for the first time since, the, since 1948, now have access to the Palestinian national narrative. They never really had access to it right. before. Um, you know, you would have to go there, yeah. right? Like I've taken, I've taken people over there. I've taken, you know, close family members, in-laws, uh, you know, hardcore evangelical Christians who believe that Israel is the Jews because Jesus said so. Um, and who have spent one week there and came back and thought, oh my God, I don't know anything about what's happening here. That's now become something that anyone can access. So when I hear our politicians or the sort of traditional media dismiss these protesters, right? Like they don't really know, <laughs> you know? Right. They're ignorant. No, you're the one who's ignorant. Right. Because you are living in a world that's 30 years ago and they are living in a world today. And if you don't understand that, then you really don't understand what's happening here at all. Yeah. yeah. Where, what I like to say to them is, they, these students know a lot more than you're giving, giving them credit for, number one. Number two, they also know a lot more than Americans knew about Iraq when we decided to bomb it <laughs> in 91 and 2003. So don't give me this thing about, you know, they're naive and they don't know enough. Yeah. Um, one of the topics that you did not cover, uh, and maybe you alluded to it because you did talk about the settlements, uh, especially in the West Bank and the, the taking over of Palestinian lands there, uh, but you didn't cover the occupation as a, uh, as, a topic, as a topic itself. Can you explain what your thinking is in terms of not making that a point mm -hmm. in the book? I would say the two biggest challenges in writing a book like this, the first one I alluded to already, which is maintaining equanimity between the two national narratives, going back and forth and allowing children to take turns 
first in the, the footsteps of the Israeli situation, then in the Palestinian, and back and forth. And, and, and I mean, this, you, you know, you wouldn't notice this if you were reading it, but it was very clear when I was doing it, is making sure that everybody had equal access, right? That even in the way that the fonts worked and in the, the color patterns, right? So the font and the color patterns on the page talking about the Holocaust is identical to the font and the color patterns mm -hmm. in the page talking about the Nakba. Mm -hmm. And you may not notice that consciously, mm -hmm. you know, but that was very deliberate on, on my part. So that was the first challenge. The second challenge was, how do I reflect the complexities of this, the history of this conflict, to the mind of a five to twelve year old, right? Which is kind of the the age range for for this book. And what I discovered very early on is that terminology doesn't matter, right? So a lot of people have said, "You don't even mention colonialism in here." All right, I don't think that that's really a term that a six-year-old would be able to truly understand. But you know what they can understand is the responsibility that the British had and that they forfeited, right? Because they understand responsibility. I don't think the term occupation was one that kids in this age range could have had an emotional access to. But you know what they can access is fairness and sharing. And so the book goes through a great deal of trouble to talk about settlements and settlement activities, but it talks about it in a very interesting way. Essentially it says that settlements are neighborhoods that used to belong to Palestinians, but which were taken away from them so that Israelis could move into it. And then I make it even more narrow, and I talk about a home. So a house that a Palestinian family used to live in, and that Palestinian family is forced to leave so that an Israeli family can move into it. The five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old gets that like that. They understand fairness. They understand sharing. They understand justice. And they see that, and Yes, the word occupation isn't in that, in that description, but the word occupation doesn't, doesn't mean anything to them. It doesn't, doesn't hit them where it matters. But fairness, sharing, justice, this is the world in which they live. They understand that. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense to them. And so that was the real challenge. So a lot of the I think a lot of adults sometimes, you know, will criticize the book and say, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention that, you didn't mention this. And my answer is, the book's not for you. The book's for your kid. And your kid, what I wanted to do is give them an emotional connection to this story. And to do that, I would have to write this in the ways that they think, in the ways that they understand the world. Um, one of the, you know, you're, you're a scholar of, of politics and religion in, in, in the current phase of interfaith relations as it relates to Israel-Palestine. There's a term now um, that is used called faith washing. And that is when interfaith dialogue is used to whitewash the crimes committed against the Palestinian yeah. people out of the need to create that equanimity or that uh, parity or, you know, let's understand <clears throat> each other. Yeah. I mean, for example, you know, What's there to understand now other than the Palestinians are getting annihilated, right? Um, and we need to do something about it. But to keep talking about, well, let's hear the different narratives on that, it takes us away from that sense of responsibility and, you know, for, for justice. Do you see that happening in interfaith forums as it relates to Israel-Palestine today? Absolutely, and I've actually been sort of caught in a lot of these conversations. This may be weird for you know a scholar of religions to say, but I have no interest in interfaith dialogue. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm interested in interfaith action. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something is a line that I borrow from my my dear friend Ibu Patel, who runs Interfaith uh, America, which is this like, okay, 
Is it important for people of different faiths to come together and talk to each other about their shared values and share ideals? Sure, that's important. But that's like JV level, mm. okay? That's the most basic thing that you could expect from the most religiously diverse nation in the world, which is what we are. Who cares that you get together and talk about things? Who cares? When you start putting your shared values into action, then I'm interested, mm -hmm. right? I'm interested in interfaith action. I am not interested in interfaith dialogue. And so you're right that so often interfaith dialogue is treated like the end of the process. And so what happens is that people get together and good for them. They're, they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They really truly want to have understanding. They really want to sort of reflect the other side. Wonderful. Great. But if it ends there, then you've done nothing, right? This is how I think about faith in general. Faith is an active principle in the world. If you are not putting your faith into practice, then you're a monk, right? <laughs> and okay, eh, nothing against monks. That's fine. Go live in a cave somewhere uh, and pray to God. But otherwise, don't, I don't want to hear about your faith. If you're not putting your faith into practice, it's not really faith to me. So I, I really think that especially when it comes to Israel-Palestine, yes, you know, some of these conversations are necessary to have, if for no other reason than to um, demonstrate, you know, the values that we all hold in common, regardless of the ways in which we talk about those values, the mythologies that we use, you know, to differentiate those values. But that's step one, right? Right. Now let's see you put those values into, into play. Do something about those values. Right. Then you've got my attention. So, uh, Reza, tell us m more about where we can uh, find this book, how we can use it in our classrooms. Yeah, uh, the book's available everywhere in any bookstore, obviously on um, Amazon and, and barnesandnoble.com. Um, there is a, a whole study guide in the back. The book is designed to be read with parents and children together. Um, it's designed to be a conversation. Um, and it's also designed to uh, create enough empty space so that parents can insert their own family values, their own ideals, um, even their own positions on this conflict, right? The book is meant to be objective enough so that parents feel as though they can have some say in the way that this message is carried to their children. And fundamentally, I think what the, the book is supposed to do in the end is not just to give you a, a sort of a context for the conflict that we are seeing right now, but more importantly, to give you the tools necessary to foster empathy and compassion and critical thinking, um, the, the tools necessary to ward off racism and prejudice and stereotypes, and then most importantly, to foster that empathetic uh, power that children already have, the ability to see the world from someone else's point of view that will become hopefully the grounding for uh, a generation that can be the advocates for peace that we need. Well, Dr. Reza Aslan, uh, mm -hmm. I thank you for your time. You've been very generous with your time. And sharing your thoughts, your incredible uh, mind in, in terms of how you see the history uh, and its impact uh, in, in this very important part of the world, even though it is tiny, uh, called Israel-Palestine. And let us all put our faith into practice by doing what all the prophets did, and that, that is achieve justice uh, first, and that way we can achieve peace. Um, I think you've done an incredible job in providing a framework for our young minds, and hopefully that will lead them to be uh, more responsible Americans and, and take uh, the ideals and values of our country more seriously. So thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having okay. me.